Hello everyone and welcome to week five of Cyclica's AI Ate My Homework. Last week, we broadly covered the fundamentals of AI, ML, DL, and the challenges with applying these computational methods in the healthcare setting. In the past weeks, we've also covered topics focused on entrepreneurship from top leaders in the industry, as well as the importance of biology in health to develop medicines. If you missed any of the previous sessions, a link to the recording will be shared with you via email. In the coming weeks, the two remaining sessions of AI Ate My Homework will be discussing applications of current AI-based technologies in drug discovery and here at Cyclica. Today, our computational scientist, Andrew Brereton, will be sharing a thoughtful discussion on pursuing scientific research with integrity. Thank you, Devesh, for the um, kind introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, to um, joining me today for this discussion. Um, just so you all know, I have the chat open on my screen. So uh, if you guys have comments or questions at any point, don't hesitate to type it in chat. Uh, I can read them. So I'll try to address anything as it comes up. Um, to start off, though, uh, let me just say a little bit about my background. Um, but I do want to keep this part short. But basically, um, I grew up in Parry Sound, Ontario. Um, I then did my um, Bachelor's of Science in Molecular Biology and Genetics at University of Guelph, um, which I enjoyed quite a bit. And then I went to do my PhD with Dr. Andy Carplus um, in a crystallography lab at Oregon State University. Um, it does say an 81 hour drive here. Um, however, that is the round trip. So thankfully it was only uh, like 40 hours when I drove back from Oregon to Toronto. Um, then in 2017, I uh, wrapped up my PhD and joined Cyclica um, pretty early on, um, definitely when it was not as large as it is now. And uh, it's been really exciting times ever since. Um, so today I'm going to be talking to you guys about uh, integrity and in research. Um, but before I get into that, I really need to go over sort of what do I mean when I talk about integrity? Integrity is a complex word that has a lot of um, different meanings, and I don't mean it um, as in the sense of having sound construction. Um, specifically, when I'm talking about integrity in this talk, I'm referring to two, uh, two aspects of the meaning. One is um, the quality of being honest and having strong moral principles. Um, and then the other is internal consistency or lack of corruption in electronic data, i.e. integrity checking. Um, when it comes to integrity in science, that's the two main ways that I like to think that, you know, our responsibility as scientists to be integrious lays here. Um, we have to make sure because our role is to discover but also communicate the truth, then we must be sure that we are communicating that truth effectively. But then additionally, so much of our work depends on actual consistency and lack of corruption in our data. Um, so it's really key that we, that we consider both aspects of integrity. Um, and then lastly, before I get into it, I just wanna say what this talk is not going to be. So um, this is not gonna be a how-to guide. Uh, I'm not here to you know, lecture people about what is or is not the, the right way to do things. Um, I don't believe there is a right answer to any of these um, examples that I'm going to present. Um, it's also not a tell-all. So I've anonymized these stories. Um, some of them are from friends. Some are things that have happened to me um, in my career. Um, but I'm not going to be, um, you know, I, I've, I've removed the juicy bits. Um, lastly, this is uh, not a presentation about the big stuff. So when it comes to ethics, uh, integrity in AI, there are many, many things um, that deserve to be talked about. Um, I'll, I'll highlight two examples in the next couple slides, but these are things that um, really deserve, you know, multi-lecture series on their own. And there are many more qualified people who, who could dis discuss those um, major issues. So if that's something that you're interested in, I encourage you to actually um, look it up and watch some stuff on YouTube. So what big stuff indeed. So here's an example of one of these sort of big problems that even though we're not going to talk about talk about it, I couldn't help, you know, putting a couple slides in. So many of you probably recognize this image. Um, this depicts the trolley problem. You know, it's a situation, it's a moral dilemma in which a trolley, a runaway trolley is going to run over these five people. Um, 
and you have access to a lever that if you pull the lever, the trolley will switch rails and run over only one person. And the traditional moral dilemma as it's presented is, do you have a moral obligation to pull the lever um, or not? And what are the implications of that? Of course, this has um, become famous in recent history because of the number of memes that have um, been spawned by this philosophical dilemma, which um, some of which are quite good in my opinion. You know, we've got a recursion, a, a recursion joke here where every runaway trolley problem is creating more runaway, runaway trolley problems. Um, you know, we've got trolley problems where <laughs> it doesn't matter, some might say, if you pull the lever or not, although I would say you should choose um, to have it play All-Star by Smash Mouth. Um, this does relate to AI though, because all of a sudden when you have autonomous systems that are making decisions without human intervention, sometimes you have to program in resolutions to these trolley problems before you've even encountered them. So here we're highlighting, or uh, here's a schematic drawn by Simon Landrin um, showing a self-driving car trolley problem where the car is not going to be able to brake in time to avoid hitting one of these people. So the question becomes, you know, should the car hit the baby or should the car hit the old lady? Um, you know, this is a bit contrived and that's partly why I don't want to talk about this today. Obviously, you know, the car could do a, many other things, but this is an important um, little thought experiment. And it's definitely one of the big topics that gets talked about a lot. Um, for the discussion later um, and how the discussion is going to work, um, although I encourage everyone. Oh, nice. We got a question. I was wondering about the trolley problem and the philosophies. Uh, oh, right. Um, I better read these out because otherwise it won't be in the recording. So we do have a question from Nina Kara. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering about the trolley problem and the philosophies it can exemplify utilitarianism plus Kantianism. How does programmer bias factor into this and how is it known to be avoided? Are there any current strategies? That is a fantastic question. Um, I'm gonna try clicking answer live and see what happens. Um, that's a fantastic question. Um, it is something that is extremely tricky. And as I said, I'm not necessarily the, the most qualified person to talk about this. I will say though that um, as far as I know, there's no explicit strategy to avoid this. Um, it really is something that needs to be thought about uh, often on a case by case basis. Um, so programmer bias is something that um, you're not always going to be aware of when you're using software, um, but there are many decisions that go into how that software functions where, um, you know, the, the programmer or programmers who made it um, just made some arbor arbitrary decision. I mean, to be fully honest, there, there's much of my own code where there are parts of the code where I was presented with, you know, a choice A or B and I, I just chose A. Um, because I considered both to be equivalent, but someone else looking at that situation might consider A and B not to be equivalent and, and there that distinction matters. So um, the last thing I would say is one general strategy um, could be you could program in the option for the user to make the choice themselves. Um, so if possible, maybe before you, for a self-driving car, for example, maybe before you get in the car, um, it shows you a bunch of trolley problems and you have to decide how you want your car to behave ahead of time. Um, hopefully that answers your question. Um, but yeah, there, we'll, we, we'll get, we can get more into this into the uh, Q&A if anybody's interested. So another example of um, a, a huge problem uh, in AI, especially in medicine, is um, data biases. So one very common data bias, um, which I just wanted to highlight as an example here, is that most biomedical testing is done on male animals. Um, and the commonly given reason for this is pretty much, um, in, in my limited opinion, not a very good one, but people argue that the estrus cycles of the female mouse um, make it less consistent um, in terms of what sort of biochemical signals you're reading out from your assays. Um, and as a result, there are often many, um, many far downstream consequences of this bias where, um, you know, decisions are being made or models are being trained on the basis of this data. Um, but this unspoken fact that these were male mice only um, is just not ever answered. And again, this example of bias here, this is just one very specific example. 
There are many, many, many problems here. And this is something that I'm not, um, definitely not qualified to cover. So this will be something that if you are interested in bias and AI, I highly encourage you to look, to look, um, to look this one up. There are a lot of interesting discussions going on in, uh, in the field right now about this. Um, so what are we gonna talk about then? Um, there's four main topics that I wanted to cover today um, using examples either from my career or from uh, one of them is from a friend uh, in Oregon. And these topics are broadly authorship and attribution, conflicts and disagreements, retractions and falsehoods, and lastly, ownership and responsibility. Um, so just to dive in, uh, when it comes to authorship and attribution, um, usually we're, when we think about this, you know, we're thinking about papers. It doesn't need to be scientific papers. It can really be anything. It could be um, an article that you're writing or a blog post that you're ghostwriting for someone. Um, it could be code that you've written, um, but someone um, pushed your code for you, so you're not in the commit. Um, here I'm just showing an example um, because I thought it was interesting to highlight. This is, as far as I know, the current uh, paper that has the most authors. There's over 5,000 authors on this paper. Um, a big question that comes up, uh, and there is, again, no right answer for this, is when should someone be listed as an author um, for a paper or publication? You know, so it, um, if they did the work, if they came up with the idea, is that enough to be listed as an author? What about if they did editing or directed the project, um, wrote the paper? As that's a pretty um, obvious one. You know, if, if they wrote the paper, they did the writing, then they should realistically be an author. My, my PI during my PhD, he had a, a hard line where if someone makes a figure, um, even a supplemental figure, then for him, that's enough to qualify for authorship. Uh, and everybody that you talk to, I think, will have a slightly different stance on this, but it's important um, as you get into your careers and as you start considering research as a career, it's important to start thinking about these questions for yourself and, and asking, like, what amount of work that I did on a project would I feel that I am owed authorship and vice versa? If I had a project that someone was helping me with, what amount of work that they did would I feel that I am obligated to give them authorship? Um, however, I think one thing that we will find is not necessarily true is if someone is in a position of power at the time the work was done, does that mean that they deserve authorship? So this is a story that comes to me from my friend Richard. Um, that's not his real name. Um, he worked for a nuclear energy company in Oregon when I was there. Um, his supervisor, his direct supervisor, was an author and did contribute to the work. However, at the time that they were about to publish, um, his supervisor asked him to add a higher level employee, basically his boss's boss, as an author. His boss's boss had not contributed anything to the paper. So at this point, the question becomes, you know, what should Richard do in a situation like this? Um, and we have the benefit for this discussion of hindsight. Um, this did happen in the past, so we can actually talk about what Richard did do. So the first thing that Richard said he did was he asked his supervisor why, you know, I think he's leaving out, like from my discussion with him, he's leaving out the part of the story where the first thing he did was kind of panic uh, for like a full day and then contact his friends and ask them questions about it. Eventually he settled on asking his supervisor why he wanted the boss's boss's name on the paper. Uh, he was told that it was to acknowledge that the work couldn't have been done without this person's uh, implicit support and that the boss's boss didn't even know that this request was being made. So Richard proposed adding a section to the acknowledgements um, and everyone is happy to the best of my knowledge. Um, this is a, a relatively cut and dry example, you know, where we get lucky here um, we get lucky here that it worked out so well for Richard. You know, he was able to ask questions. He was able to say, um, you know, why, why is this something that you're asking for? And he was able to come up with a compromise solution um, that everyone was happy with. But I have some discussion questions here and I'll show these on a slide at the end as well, um, if anybody wants to discuss them. But basically some questions that I find interesting 
are, you know, why, first of all, why might it matter that attribution is correct on a paper? You know, could there be negative consequences for false attribution? Um, how do you think the situation was handled? You know, are there ways that this situation could have gone badly? Um, what else might Richard have done in this um, situation? Um, so that's, that's basically it for authorship and attribution. The next section that I hope we can get into here is conflicts and disagreements. So conflict is something that arises uh, basically all the time. Like this, if you're not disagreeing with people, um, as a research scientist, um, that's, that's something that you should be questioning. Um, there's many, many di different types of disagreement that can be occurring, you know, both in industry or in academics. You know, there's your lab versus competing labs. There's you as an individual versus, you know, your own mentor, perhaps. Um, you versus the status quo. Um, your company versus competing companies. But in general, scientific disagreement should be treated as an opportunity to learn something new. Um, if one of you, you know, if two people are disagreeing, um, you know, worst case, both of you are wrong, but uh, most often one of you is correct. And treating, an, treating a disagreement as an opportunity to learn something really goes a long way to making sure that um, you're handling that disagreement well. So in this section, I wanted to highlight a specific example from my career, which was um, my lab versus a competing lab, basically. Um, this is an email that we got um, from a competing lab, basically. Andy is my former, former PI, which stands for Principal Investigator. That's basically the person who was in charge, the professor that was in charge of the lab um, where I was doing my PhD. So. These two researchers um, from this other lab came to um, talk with us in person. Um, we had a conversation about a project that they were working on, and they told us, um, you know, we're not crystallographers, uh, and we don't know the answer to this, so we wanted to get a crystallographer's opinion. We gave them that opinion, and the opinion was, hey, um, this work is flawed for XYZ reason. Um, you guys really need to reconsider these experiments. The next day we received an email that said, with some hesitation, I decided to go ahead and publish this. Um, this email is actually quite respectful in my opinion. Um, however, um, what they did in the acknowledgments of the paper was a little less respectful. Um, they wrote, we are especially indebted to my PI and um, Brian Matthews, another um, person in this field, um, discoverer of the Matthews coefficient. Uh, if anybody is a crystallography nerd in the audience, um, for many uh, critical insights that sharpened our focus. So basically in the acknowledgements to their paper, they alluded to the discussion that we had where we told them that these experiments were flawed and that the work was, the conclusions of the work were not valid. And they used that conversation as a sort of tool to say, hey, look, these crystallographers have legitim legitimatized um, our work, which, um, was definitely not the case. So in this particular instance, the issue we were discussing um, was how planar are the peptide bonds in a protein? Um, the answer is usually at least a little non-planar, planar, um, sometimes very non-planar. Um, the disagreement that we had was this, this lab was insisting that peptide bonds should be modeled as planar and that there's no good evidence that they are non-planar. So obviously we took issue with this. Um, how we resolved this was actually fairly straightforward. First, we asked them questions about their paper. Um, we asked them for the details of their experiments and their data. We repeated every experiment they did. We added positive and negative controls so that we would, we would basically um, know if the results from the experiments are meaningful or not. We showed that the results um, were false. Um, not necessarily false, like the results are the results that they obtained, and we could obtain the same results, just that their interpretation of those results um, doesn't mean what they believed that it, that it meant. And as a result, this actually ended up being a very straightforward project. You know, we just had to go through and debunk a series of claims that another um, group was making. And this formed about one third of my final thesis. Um, we even 
got to thank them in our acknowledgments saying, you know, the authors thank Redacted and Redacted for answers to questions about their study and also for providing the coordinate sets they generated by their refinements and the exact parameters of their refinements and the list of P2B codes they use for their figure five. Um, this was, this was a, a protracted conflict. This, this took about, um, you know, six months to a year start to finish. Um, but in the end, I think it it turned out well. That's my that's my opinion. <laughs> um, some discussion points, though, are you know when does it make sense to walk away from a disagreement? So like if if we had been doing this um, project and eventually found that you know it was it was just too much work, at, at what stage you know at what stage do we walk away and say like oh maybe this isn't um, isn't gonna be productive? Um, another important question is, uh, how to handle it when it turns out that you're wrong. So this is something that, you know, it's, it can be a little uncomfortable, but if you're going to engage in, um, a scientific conflict like this, it, it's really critical to sort of imagine that scenario where something comes up, some evidence, some new evidence or something, and you realize, uh, you were super wrong the whole time uh, to never visualize that and to never be ready for that. Um, means that you're you're likely to not um, engage in an honest argument. Um, how civil should you be? Uh, I think it goes without saying that you should probably be very civil and very polite. But I think it's also important to know that you know if someone is not being civil to you, you don't have to tolerate that. Um, and then lastly, uh, can you prevent disagreements? from coming up and then import equally importantly, sh if you could, should you, um, you know, I alluded at the beginning, like what is the, you know, the, there's a lot of value that comes out of these um, conflicts and disagreements. So if they can be handled well with integrity on both sides, then that's maybe it is something that isn't worth preventing. Um, so we'll get back to this hopefully in the Q and A at the end, but um, the next thing I wanted to cover was, um, retractions and falsehoods. So again, with falsehoods, um, there's, there's many different ways that something can be untrue. So, you know, it can be something that someone is um, presenting in, in an actual effort to mislead. Um, it can be an accident due to ignorance. Um, literally, there are many, many more ways that, to be wrong about something than there are to be right about something. Um, however, whenever you are considering, um, you know, someone's actions, uh, is specifically something that, you know, looks like a mistake, it's important to remember Hanlon's razor, which is never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by stupidity. However, um, based on this, Hanlon sounds kind of um, a little too rude for me. So I prefer to say never attribute to malice that which is adequately explained by a mistake. Um, because everybody makes mistakes, you know, even smart people make mistakes. And just because someone made a mistake doesn't mean you need to start judging uh, the quality of their character or their intelligence. Um, so with that said, I wanted to get into a specific example here. So fairly recently, there was an unnamed competitor to Cyclica. I mean, they have a name, I'm just anonymizing them. Um, they made a big claim. Uh, they said they had a new algorithm that can take X days from start to finish to make novel drugs that exist outside the training set. Um, this is an interesting and fairly big claim. However, the issue arose when pretty much immediately after making this claim, an even larger claim was made by the media that the new algorithm did take X days from start to finish to make novel drugs for a specific target. And that for the first time, the generated molecules were validated in vitro and in vivo. I mean, there's a lot to unpack here. Um, the fact that they're saying that it did take explicitly this many days, um, but they're not defining sort of what start and finish means, that the drugs are novel, that the drugs are for a specific target, um, and this claim of the first, of it being the first time. Before I get into any of these details, though, I just want to say the work itself uh, and the paper detailing the work are very well done. They're interesting and, in my opinion, um, completely worthwhile. So these did represent um, 
you know, meaningful work that has contributed to this field overall. And I think that that should be kept in mind while we're talking about sort of this, um, this snafu that came afterwards. So to start with, let's look at this first time claim. Um, if you go to Google and you just search for first time algorithm drug, uh, you get 9.5 million results. Uh, and going through these, it's pretty clear to see uh, everyone loves claiming to be the first at something. Um, this is uh, an Accentia post here, drug designed by AI to enter human trials for the first time. Pharma's AlphaGo moment for the first time in AI has blah, blah, blah. Um, is AI creating drugs of the future? For the first time, a team of scientists has used artificial intelligence to create a useful drug. Um, that one's just offensive, honestly. What is a non-useful drug and why would people create it? Um, so the thing about this, these claims of first time, um, when someone claims a sort of a genuine first, like, you know, the first person to walk on the moon, that is a very verifiable and it's also a very broad statement. So that's the type of first statement that is impactful, exciting, and meaningful. And those types of events definitely do occur in medicine, you know, like the first, the first recombinant human protein that was ever synthesized, et cetera, et cetera. Um, however, you can, you can have a first by just being specific. So the more specific you get, the more likely it is that you're the first person to do it. Um, so when you do see all this hype in the media about first time, first time, it's, it's often not actually that big of a deal. Additionally, the media went really wild here with claims of novelty. Um, so I'm showing on the left here the structure of this new drug. And I, I'm not going to go into, you know, the chemistry. Um, I'm also not necessarily a, even a very good chemist, to be honest. Um, but on the left here, we've got the new drug. And on the right, we've got panatinib. Um, this is an anti-cancer medicine that is FDA approved, I believe. Um, and the big thing, the big takeaway here is that, you know, in the community, um, you know, some chemists consider this novel relative to this. Um, others, definitely not. So there's no clear consensus as to, you know, does this represent a novel drug? Um, and is the media qualified to make these claims? You know, like, who is actually claiming novelty here is an important factor. So if you are before we get to, you know, what are some of these discussion points, if you are interested in learning more about this story and, you know, how did, how did this all play out, um, I highly recommend checking out Derek Lowe. Um, his blog posts are usually um, very fair, um, very balanced, and very well informed. And he does actually have a, a blog post about this situation. It's called, Has AI Discovered a Drug Now? Guess. Um, so, can definitely recommend that. So in terms of discussion here, there's a lot of things that I think um, are, are important. So first of all, the obvious one, do you as a scientist have a responsibility to correct the record when you've misinformed? Um, I think this is, I know I said there's no right answers. Um, so I'm kind of going against my own statements here, but the answer is yes. You, you, if you put a falsehood into your paper, um, you do have a responsibility to correct that falsehood. However, where it becomes more complicated is, you know, do you as a scientist have a responsibility to correct the record when other people are misinterpreting your work? So if someone is going, um, you know, taking a small claim in your paper and then juicing it up, um, do you have a responsibility to speak up yourself and correct them? Um, if you benefit from that misinterpretation, does that change things? So, uh, you know, it's not that far-fetched to imagine a situation where a company um, puts out a paper, the media makes some big claims about the paper. The company knows that those aren't correct, but um, you know is able to go get interest from investors on the basis of those media claims. Now we would hope that over time, you know, the scientists who are the scientists and uh, experts who are working with, you know, these investors are going to hopefully you know do their due diligence and realize what's going on here. Um, but that's not always the case. So where does your responsibility? Um, as part of a company, as part of a lab, as an individual scientist, you know, where does your responsibility lie there? Um, and also equally important, how can you avoid situations like this from arising in the first place? You know, so can you write your paper in such a way that, you know, minimizes the risk of misinterpretation? 
Um, in the case of you know this example, if this company had um, a section in the paper that was written by a chemist and was describing you know the extent and the nature of the supposed novelty, um, that would go a long way towards credibility here, and it would have prevented the media from being able to really run away with things as they did. So, I'll I'll be honest, like to me as a scientist in this space that move by the company to not speak up and correct the record did hurt their credibility um, to me and probably to other scientists as well. So the last thing um, that I wanted to talk about today um, is ownership and responsibility. Um, so this is something that um, if you guys are, you know, especially if you're interested in, you know, writing, but also programming, um, these are things that you're going to have to think about. Um, so I'll give you an example here. I'll give you two examples. Um, the first one is some software that I wrote during my PhD. Um, this is the Python package. It's up on um, PyPy. It's called the Ensembleator. It's just for comparing protein structures, basically. Um, so we're looking at the GitHub page here. And the thing that I want to highlight is um, you'll notice that I did some things two months ago. Um, I converted it to Python 3, and I listed it on pip. This is because some people who were using the package emailed me and said, hey, uh, it's not working, why? And it turned out that it was because they were trying to use it with Python 3. Um, I realized that you know, if I want it to work in the modern era, I need to convert it to Python 3. Um, but, the, but this was sort of weird to me because this is something that I, as far as I was concerned, you know, I wrote the paper on it and I was done with it y years ago. But it turns out that you know people are using it and people are interested and it wasn't working the way it should so i had to go in and fix it um do i have a responsibility to do that and if so how long does that responsibility exist additionally when it comes to integrity there's another really important consideration which is if you're saying that you know you have results there's a paper that basically comes with this software package that says you know, here's what you can use it for, for example, here's some results. <laughs> uh, Joshua Payne in the chat says, not a question, but the ensemble later seems dope. Uh, thank you, Joshua. Um, yeah, so if you have a paper um, that's using software, you're going to need to specify the software version and things like that so that others can come and repeat the work, essentially. That's, that's where sort of uncorruptible data integrity comes into play. Um, one useful thing to do is if you are the owner of the software yourself, um, tag a publication version of the software so that um, anyone who's trying to repeat the results of that publication can specifically just clone that software to the specific version that was used in the publication and then verify that they're going to get the same results, essentially, if that's what they uh, intend to do. Um, but we don't need to use my code as an example of what to do or not do, because quite frankly, the Ensembleator um, is not the best code I've ever written or even remotely close. Um, the next story I wanted to share is a little weirder, in my opinion. At least it's something that, as a researcher, I never expected to have to deal with this, um, nor had I ever um, had anyone tell me to expect this. So this is the title uh, and some title, I guess, of an article that I wrote. Um, it's now hosted on Medium. So those of you that browse Medium right, might recognize this interface. Um, you know, it's just a short article. It's an 11 minute read. Um, it says here June 2019, but I actually wrote it in 2016. And uh, the, the weird thing is, as this article was up, I started getting emails from people saying like, hey, you know, this is a topic that I'm interested in, you know, I have this mutation or whatever, and I've been struggling finding, you know, literature about it. Um, and just basically thanking me for taking the time to write it. Like, um, you know, it's the first article I've come across that doesn't focus on the exercise induced symptoms. And that's also like, that's why I wrote it, because I was interested in this and I was, um, you know, fresh out of my genetics, be it um, bachelor's of science. And I, and I was like, you know what? I, I, I've, I'm reading the literature, I can write something about this. And after doing that, I got a lot of interest in it. Um, but 
only a lot relative to what I expected. You know, it's still a small number of people, but it's people who are being genuinely helped by this. The problem arises when we realize that this article was hosted on my original website. Um, now, I'm not a web designer, um, despite working at a company like Cyclica, where we have many talented web de designers. I'm sure if I showed them this web page, they would probably um, have a lot to say about it. Um, needless to say, I at the time, I thought this was very cool. Um, so in this blog section, that's where I basically had my article. And the issue arose when I decided to shut down this website for obvious reasons. Um, it's now a much simpler plain HTML website. But before I shut down, I went to the Google Analytics to look at um, incoming traffic. And I noticed that the bulk of the traffic that I was getting to the website was actually people who were specifically searching. So these are search terms that they're typing into Google. And they were specifically searching for um, information about this genetic disorder. And for some reason, perhaps because it was, um, you know, what, one of the very few things actually talking about this genetic disorder, that was why it was showing up for the people who are looking for this information. So I sort of felt like I had a responsibility before I shut down the website to port this article over to Medium so that people who wanted to read it could still read it. And, you know, since then I have gotten comments from people similarly still saying, you know, thank you for blah, blah, blah. But that couldn't have happened if I had just deleted my website without thinking about it. And I'll be honest, there was also a, an, an article about how to make a travel ukulele that got a similar level of interest, um, which I did delete. So to me, I felt like a travel ukulele, making a travel ukulele is not as important as, you know, someone obtaining information about uh, a disorder that they believe they may or may not have. Um, so do you become responsible for something that you've made available? Um, and if so, when you release it, is it, uh, do you become responsible the second you release it? Or do you only become responsible when people start using it? Um, what about if it costs you something? You know, like I was hosting that website, um, so I wanted to shut it down so I didn't have to spend time and effort on it. Um, do you have, and lastly, like, do you have to maintain your code? Um, I have, I have, more abandoned repos than I have maintained repos, but the ones that are maintained, um, I now feel a very real obligation that I have to keep maintaining those. So when you're, when you're setting out to make something, it's important to consider like, if I succeed at this um, and people start to use it, is that something that I'm ready for um, to have that kind of ownership and responsibility over this thing? Um, with that, I'd like to say uh, thanks for listening. Um, thanks for participating. And I'm going to open it up to the Q&A now. I've, I've put the, the notes here on the screen. So any of these topics are fair game. And if anybody has answers, that'd be great. Oh, we got one. Uh, Nina Kara, medical trolley problem. Okay, uh, I got to click answer live. A good trolley problem might be whether to give organs to one patient or another. Oh, very good. Ah, that's very good. What makes someone more qualified to receive organs than another? If patient A is on wait list sooner, but is lower risk, has less need than patient B, you could argue that it's first come, first serve, or that it's less imperative that patient A receives it. Could AI streamline this? That's an excellent point of view. Um, triage is an area in general where probably we're going to run into a lot of, um, you know, trolley problem type situations. You know, if we have AI assisted triage where, you know, um, we're using images of wounds or things like that. That's something where that information is gonna be presented to humans, but depending on how those summaries are made, that human may or may not have all the information they need to make an important decision as to essentially who gets treated first. Um, thank you, Nina, that's a excellent example. Um, Devesh, I know you're still listening. If you had anything uh, that you feel like you wanna add as well, feel free. Actually, you know, I'll, I'll go for it. Andrew, I'm really curious, um, you know, when you talk about maintaining your code and, you know, maintaining applications or even your articles, I'm curious on your insights too. Like, you know, what is your responsibility there? When should you learn to kind of give up? Because, you know, you've got other priorities or other things at stake. Uh, you know, do you want to discuss a little bit more on, you know? Yeah, are, sure. Uh, you know? That's a great point. I mean, like to me, I don't even have a good answer for myself, I guess. Um, 
but to me where it kind of stands is um, you know, one, how useful is the code? Um, you know, how many people are using it? To what degree do they need it? If you can assess that, um, you know, so the more, m the more people are using it or enjoying it, the more I do feel like, you know, maybe I should be maintaining it. But another question is how easy would it be for other people to maintain it? Like if it's, it's open source and other people can fork it and fix bugs themselves if they, if they know how to program. So, I think in a very real sense, if I've written good code that I believe is understandable, I feel less like I need to maintain it. With the Ensemblator, why I highlighted that as an example is it is kind of poorly written code um, that I wrote when I was first learning. And as a result, it would be extremely difficult, I expect, for other programmers to understand what's going on. And so when anything goes wrong with it, I I look at that situation and I have to acknowledge that, you know, what might be one or two hours of my time to fix could be, you know, two or three weeks of someone else's time to fix. And, and that does kind of make me feel an obligation um, to, to, to maintain it. Um, does that answer your question, Dave? Davish? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I might have another one. So I'll, I'll wait for uh, some of the other Q and A's to kind of pile in and ask my next Sure. One. Yeah. I got another question here from Nina. Um, Thinking about attribution, I know there is a lot of debate about this as science is looked at to be for a general good, not just IP, definitely. Um, however, fair attribution is important for mental health, for future opportunities, et cetera. Is there a way to check for fair attribution? Another great question um, from Nina. Um, the short answer is twofold. Um, one, I wish there was, and two, if there is and anybody knows about it, please share it. Um, I think the, the best way would probably be to, you know, if you're thinking about a paper, like a scientific paper, and you wanted to, you know, ensure that fair attribution had gone on, um, you could contact the authors themselves, especially the first author, um, ask them how they felt about the attribution. Um, usually a good place is you can check the acknowledgements as well, because that's sort of the gray area where people who may or may not have, you know, deserved authorship sometimes end up just in the acknowledgements or vice versa. Um, and in terms of in your own situation, if you're dealing with an authorship or attribution situation and you're not sure if you're being given fair attribution, um, that's a situation where mentorship is incredibly valuable. So, um, reach out to people, you know, friends, even family, you know, everybody in their life deals with um, credit and attribution at some point in some context. So this is a topic that definitely everybody has feelings about, you know, what, constitu what constitutes fair attribution. And I think that you can really get value out of, you know, asking other people about your situation. Um, getting, but ultimately it has to be your decision um, as to whether or not you believe something is fair. And if it's not fair, stand up and say something. Um, you don't need to just accept an unfair situation. Um, hopefully that answers your question, Nina. Andrew, do you mind if I shoot my second question at you? Sure, go ahead. Um, so, you know, Scientific communication, you know, marketing communication is very important. And, you know, at least at Cyclica, we're really integral to, you know, the type of media that we're putting out, the type of like, you know, everything from written to visuals to even audio, we're really careful on what we put out and making sure that it's scientifically vetted and what we're putting out is truthful. Um, you know, maybe do you want to talk a little bit about, you know, working hand in hand together to make sure that, you know, the material that we're putting out is truthful uh, that the results are scientifically vetted and sort of what that relation looks like as a team. Yeah, that's a, that's great. Actually. I, that's something that I wish I had thought to add into the presentation. Um, I'm really fortunate, um, to have, you know, when I was looking at places to work and places to, you know, do my research, one thing that interested me about Cyclica was the culture and the atmosphere. Um, there was a, a lot of collaboration going on between everybody working there. And even now, years later, I'm still quite happy in that decision that I made then. Um, working with Cyclica, there is such a value on integrity, especially scientific integrity. Um, as a scientist, if I bring something up like, hey, you know, Devesh, our marketing is not quite correct here. You know, we need to change this, et cetera, et cetera. That's never met with negative pushback. That's always met with, you know, enthusiastic 
cooperation um, and it, and it goes both ways really um, just being part of a team where everybody um, welcomes um, challenges to the status quo as a way to grow it's a really healthy um, attitude because you end up just putting out much higher quality stuff in general um, so I got another question here from an anonymous attendee very exciting um, lots of pharma companies launch legacy molecules, which differ in small ways, i.e. handedness uh, in antimers. Do you find this to be obvious or non-obvious in regards to IP issues? Can AI help combat against this? Any thoughts on this in general as companies hide behind patents? Uh, yeah, I have lots of thoughts about this and Devesh would probably stop me from sharing about half of them um, because I can be quite abrasive about it. Um, I don't think... I don't think there is an obvious answer to this. Um, there are so many baked in um, legal issues uh, into IP and that's not even acknowledging the moral issues. Um, like how can you own a molecule in the first place? Like what do you really own when, it, when you have, you know, the ownership of the IP of a molecule, what are you actually owning there? Um, so when it comes to handedness, it just seems in particular strange because while the, while the chemical effect or the biochemical effect um, of a switch in handedness can be extremely dramatic, um, the difference in terms of like obviousness um, is usually pretty low. Like, so for me, I think it's going to depend on a lot of factors, um, some of which would include like, you know, how many chiral centers are there in the molecule? If there's only one, I don't necessarily think that, you know, switching the handedness of that chiral center is going to necessarily be very non-obvious but if it's some large natural product where there's you know many many chiral centers no one would have the ability to you know enumerate all of them um and in that case um in that case it it, it might make sense if you made an argument that you know this enantiomer is significantly not obvious um I think AI can combat against this. I think that we're going to see, you know, more people using AI as a way of vetting claims um, of novelty. Um, there is an open question right now in chemo informatics, which is, what does it even mean for two molecules to be similar? Um, and that's an area where I think as we get better with AI um, answering that question of similarity, we are going to be able to, you know, look for, you know, is this claim of obviousness um, or non-obviousness valid because if these molecules are actually quite similar maybe that's not a valid claim okay so we got another comment here in chat let me just pull it up um, from carolyn quinlan um, i'm replying to the example you gave about experimenters using only male mice it's important to notice this represents a much bigger problem many drugs intended for women are tested only on men that's horrible. Uh, example, painkillers generally, uh, a DD, the female sexual dysfunction drug. It's important that researchers consider stakeholder ethics. Women are paying taxes for drugs that are marketed to them, but aren't designed for them and aren't proved to be safe or effective for them. Um, literally preach. It is, you know, I, I didn't want to swear on here, but you know, it is bullshit. Um, the fact that the fact that more people aren't aware of things like this is frankly disturbing. And I think it is so important for, for people at every stage of this process to consider, you know, how am I contributing to a system where these biases are already baked in? What, so, you know, what can you do in your position, no matter where you are on this pipeline to make sure that the work that you're producing is being done in a fair and equitable way. That's something that I think is particularly important. And um, Carolyn, thank you for sharing those details with us. Okay, uh, another anonymous question here. Um, how can a biotech balance an open source culture and data sharing while ensuring their privacy and competitiveness on the market? Um, that's a great question. Um, so I can't, I'm, uh, I can't necessarily speak to how anyone can do it, but I can speak a little bit to how we do it at Cyclica. Um, so we do release some open source software um, most recently. Um, software that I um, spearheaded called Deriver, which is for generation of novel chemical entities. Um, we just um, posted the paper onto ChemArchive. You know, it should go live in the next couple of days. Um, and the software itself is, you know, pip installable. You can just type pip install Deriver. Um, and 
how can we balance that with you know our 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 responsibility to our shareholders our our responsibility to ourselves as a company um the the key i think is you know twofold one you have to imagine like if we make this open source and our competitors start using it is that going to hurt us and i think if the answer is yes you can't really afford to open source it so at least with cyclica everything that we open source is something that you know it's not our it's not our secret sauce so to speak um we wouldn't want to open source our secret sauce per se um although we can definitely talk about it that's usually where you would need um a patent to protect yourself in most cases um next um the other element of it is if if you open sourcing it means other people will use it and other people using it means that they will find bugs or improve it by adding features or whatever then those are improvements that you then get to immediately fold into how you're using that software so um there can be big benefits from open sourcing something that is even if it's part of your pipeline because all of a sudden you're going to get a lot more um excitement and energy in that space with people you know contributing themselves Um so hopefully that addresses your question. Um we've got another question here from Nina Kara. I was I and I hope I hope I'm pronouncing everyone's name correctly um by the way. I'm I'm sorry if I don't pronounce any correctly. Um okay so I was I was wondering what your thoughts were about pressure in academia plus industry by reviewers and people who want to launch products respectively. Pressure in academia by review. Okay. According to a few scientists, this causes stress and a perceived need to potentially falsify results. This is unfortunate to the growing problem of research reproducibility. I was wondering if you knew of a way that this is being combated in great lab settings slash kind journals. Um, another great question. Um, yeah, it is stressful, and there is this push. Um, everybody, I can't say everybody. Many people, myself included, sometimes feel this. Um, you know, if I don't. if i don't publish um i'm not going to have any proof that i've been doing a good job in my career you know etc etc and in fact you know many funding agencies will just look at you know number of publications as a sort of metric for you know how good of a scientist is this person even though that's that's baloney um as for how to combat that you know there's a couple of ways first of all you know i don't believe um that people should participate in the scientific journal industry anymore I think it's this is my personal opinion and does not represent the opinion of um really anybody that I work with. Um I don't think we should contribute to that system anymore. I consider the journal industry to be essentially parasitic. Um I think that in in this in this day and age we see a lot of amazing peer review going on in a format where like um you know preprints are being put out. people are discussing them there's there's anonymized review but whether it's anonymized or not you know you're getting comments on a web page where the article is hosted and the authors can reply to those comments and the authors can iteratively improve the manuscript itself you know with a version 2 and a version 3 i think especially with computational work and reproducibility we're seeing a lot more instances where really good labs and uh, research groups are making an effort to explicitly tie the paper to the code such that you know as things change there are literally tagged versions where it's like this is version 1 of the paper in the code this is version 2 of the paper in the code and and lastly um we're seeing a lot of work towards benchmarking and um like community competitions so actually if i were to summarize in general i would say the way that the way that this should be combated is as a community like only by individually um you know taking our stance as individuals as to where we stand in this issue that collectively adding up as we all do it as a community is what's going to help um improve this issue over time um so when i am when i'm interviewing people to potentially hire them i don't look at you know number of papers published as a meaningful metric i i look at the papers i read the papers i consider the value of the work itself um or like the quality of the work itself as far as i can ascertain it but i'm not i'm not counting citations i'm not all of all of that is from as far as i'm concerned a previous generation that i don't want any part of well said andre i think you know we've got time for one question and if not maybe you could have some closing remarks 
Sure. Yeah. Let's let's just give it a minute for um, a final question if anybody has one. Um, okay. In Richard, in Richard's maybe a typo, uh, but I hope not. In Richard Harris's book named Rigor Mortis, cool name for a book. He claims that the industry is less prone to falsifying data than academia since there are harsher control for drug approval and that the drug has to sale. Richard, sorry. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Um, I think that's bullshit. Uh, I don't have any you know, data to back that up. And honestly, I'd be surprised if Richard Harris had really meaningful data to back that up, but I haven't read the book, so he could. Um, but I think that you know, drug approval is one thing and falsifying data at that stage is going to be harder. Um, but, you, but what you do instead is, you know, you don't falsify the data. You just construct the experiments in a way that, you know, are designed to show what you want. You know, we were talking about it earlier um, when Carolyn brought up, um, you know, they're testing painkillers that are marketed towards women on men in the clinical trial. So that's not that's that's how they're falsifying data essentially um so there is explicitly this this pressure and i'm definitely not going to name names but a certain big pharma company um that i interacted with at, at one point um i will say that there is a pressure that they face internally um on like you know a machine learning team or whatever where you know they don't necessarily, their job security depends on, you know, them being the only people who can do the work that they're doing. So if some other tools come along that are better um, to too much of a degree, you will often see um, the, the results that get falsified are like benchmarking performance tests and stuff like that. So anything that has these harsh controls, you're not going to really see falsification, um, I think, in an obvious way. Um, but all the stuff that happens b behind the scenes, I would be shocked um, to find out that everyone that I've interacted with um, has been a per an individual of high integrity and has not lied. Um, so I'll just close with some closing remarks, I guess. Um, uh, first of all, thanks everyone for attending. Um, I will say the chat is much more polite and well-spoken than Twitch chat. Um, so that's exciting. Um, the thing I want to leave everybody with is um, ask questions, you know, just keep asking questions. And if someone claims like, you know, this is, you know, this is not fair, but this is the way it has to be, ask them why, um, you know, you don't have to be silent and you don't have to take answers at face value. You know, if you're a researcher, if you're a scientist, it's your job literally to uncover um, the truth and, bring that into the way that you're actually dealing with these situations as well. Ask questions, figure out what's really going on. And, you know, don't be afraid to talk to people, reach out for help and talk to people. You know, we are a community and we're all in this together. So um, let's work on it together. Thanks. Beautifully said, Andrew. Uh, thank you to all our attendees and we look forward to seeing you for the last two sessions of AI homework in the coming weeks. So stay tuned. <laughs>